All right. Well, she should do some formal introduction. I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Janice Phillips. Dr. Janice Phillips is um, one of the most remarkable, energetic nurse researchers I've ever met. And uh, I first met her, I think it was at the N NIH when she was working uh, there, and uh, really uh, committed breast cancer uh, researcher. And when she came to the University of Chicago, she said, I want to get in engaged, I want to be involved, and I want to re do research. And I had heard so much about her work before she ever got to the university. And one of the things that I think is really special about uh, Janice is that she's a doer and she's very passionate about uh, helping the community and we were so blessed to have been able to recruit her to join our team at the University of Chicago. And uh, she's going to talk to us about her work within the task force, her work uh, speaking about breast cancer in the community and, uh, and I'll let her introduce um, Ms. Akpan because uh, I've also I had the uh, opportunity to work with her uh, you know, in different uh, conferences, uh, and uh, between the two of them, they will give you a spectacular uh, talk on uh, breast cancer in Chicago. And then uh, we're going to have uh, Ms. Gilliam from the um, Illinois Department of Public Health also. Me, me, sorry, Metro Chicago, uh, talk about breast cancer in the city. And I'll uh, let uh, Janice uh, introduce Ms. Gilliam. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see so many familiar faces. And to those of you in the overflow room, hello. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my uh, two colleagues. Uh, they're going to share with you their um, experiences in terms of working with the Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force. Uh, it's my honor to introduce my colleague, Marie Gilliam, who is the new executive director of the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force. And she's going to share with you a little bit about the state of breast cancer here in the city of Chicago. My other colleague, Barb Agpan, I've known Barb for a number of years, and, and Barb is a, a survivor, but also a strong community advocate. So they're going to share with you the state of breast cancer in Chicago. Barb's going to share with you her personal perspective in terms of what women are actually experiencing here. And then I'm going to wrap things up with my perspective on directions for the future. First of all, good morning, everyone. Good morning. George and I have known each other since college. I, too, was not a morning person. And then I had a daughter. And then I had a dog. <laughs> so now my days begin at 5 a.m., they end at 1 a.m., and I have four great hours to sleep. So <laughs> my level is always high. OK, so I'll talk about the state of breast cancer in Chicago. Um, as uh, Dr. Phillips uh, already indicated, myself, along with Dr. Phillips and Barb Agpan, who is a member of our Board of Directors for the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force, as well as a member of the National Black Nurses Association and a breast cancer survivor. So the title of this conference is Uniting to Address Breast Cancer Disparities in Chicago. So let's look at the past progress. Uh, in 2007, there was a paper, and it was called The Black-White Disparity in Breast Cancer Chicago, an example in Chicago. There was also a report that was generated in uh, conjunction with this paper talking about what really is going on in breast cancer in Chicago for the African-American woman. If you look at the uh, black and white breast cancer mortality, you look at the period of 1980 through 2003, you'll see a couple of things. First, if you look at 1980, the mortality was similar between a black woman and a white woman. If a white woman was diagnosed with breast cancer, 37.4 per 100,000 were likely to die. Uh, if you looked at African American women, it was 38.1, not a huge disparity. If you go through 2003, you notice a few things happen, changes in research, changes in outcomes, 
uh, advances in medicine, uh, increased education and outreach, and the work of organizations like uh, Susan G. Komen for the Cure, the Avon Foundation, and the American Cancer Society really worked to reduce the, dis to reduce the mortality rate of white women. So they went from 37.4 all the way down to 24. 24 per 100,000 uh, white women died of breast cancer in Chicago. If you look at African American women, it did not change. In fact, it went up slightly, which meant that all of the advances in breast cancer, all of the advances in treatment and research and outreach did not affect the African American woman. Is it a black woman issue or is it a geographic issue? If you look at New York, you look at the United States, and you look at Chicago, you see that there is a slight disparity um, in the US data, which is the maroon data. If you look at New York, which is a similar city, they actually have a lower disparity. If you look at Chicago, you see that this is not a black-white issue. This is a Chicago issue. And this is very specifically a Chicago issue. It's not an inner city issue. It's a Chicago issue. When you now look at where the breast cancer mortality is taking place, all of these, I saw on the camera that they all of these um, areas are all of the blocked out communities in Chicago. And you see the west side and you see the south side. And that's where it's happening. So we came up with three hypotheses that explained the breast cancer disparity. The first was simple. Black women receive fewer mammograms which meant that they didn't find out that they had breast cancer until it was too late. The second was black women received mammograms of inferior quality, so that if they did go in for a mammogram, they didn't get the same mammograms. They got a mammogram that may show them that they didn't have breast cancer, and they did. And then the third is that black women had an inadequate access to quality treatment once they were diagnosed. So if a woman found out she did have breast cancer, was the treatment the same? Was every institution's treatment the same? And did a black woman have the access to the best treatment at the best institutions? So there was a call to action summit in March of 2007. So we're here today, but this isn't the first time we've all been at the table. Um, there was an access to mammography, a quality of mammography, and a quality of treatment. They came up with 37 recommendations that they felt would reduce the breast cancer mortality in Chicago. That report was released in October of 2007, and here it is. As you see, it's incredibly thick. One of the, uh, also, uh, we talked about establishing a consortium of breast cancer and screening treatment centers in Chicago. We felt that these things would be integral to reducing the breast cancer disparity. The 37 recommendations covered four different areas. One is establishing a task force office. Second was improving access to mammography. The third was uh, improving the quality of the mammography process, and then improving the quality of the treatment that someone received. In October of 2008, uh, Steve Whitman released the next set of data, which took us to 2005. And if you notice, we went from a 68% disparity to 116%, which meant that just being black in Chicago made you twice as likely to die from breast cancer than a white woman. And that is despicable. So this issue is definite for the African-American uh, community. But we're not saying that it's just a black issue. Any woman with a socioeconomic barrier to care is subject to be part of this disparity. 
So our initial funding came from the Susan G. Komen for the Cure and the Avon Foundation to form the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force and to fund our project, the Chicago Breast Cancer Quality Consortium. Who's involved? Clinicians, nurses, managers, researchers, community leaders, breast cancer survivors, representing hospitals, clinics, uh, patient organizations. Uh, our mission is to serve as a catalyst to reduce the racial, ethnic, and class disparity in the breast cancer mortality rate in metropolitan Chicago. <coughs> so we looked at what happened in the past. So what's our future direction? What's needed? Transparency. We need to be able to share data, to share outcomes, to collaborate on establishing quality standards for all institutions. Our Chicago Breast Cancer Quality Consortium is up and running. We are actively recruiting institutions to become part of the pro quality process to help us come up with the solutions for uh, our quality issues. Outreach and education. So educating the patients, the community, on why it is so important to get a mammogram, why early detection is incredibly important, to establish partnerships within communities that include patients, providers, and the medical centers, and to allow a woman to access available in, uh, resources within the medical center with no barriers. So if a woman needs care, all of the care that she is able to have should be available to her without any regard to how she can pay for it. Partnerships. This isn't gonna take just one person. We need partnerships with physicians, with community leaders, with the faith communities, with the researchers, with community hospitals, and with our academic medical centers. And investment. We all have to see this as an incredible problem. And it's gonna take a village to solve it. Our result, we hope that by completing the 37 recommendations, we'll have quality screening and treatment available for all women and we will reduce the breast cancer disparity in mortality in Chicago. The Reducing Breast Cancer Disparities Act. This bill for someone who has private insurance allows coverage for needed pain medications and eliminates their co-pays and deductibles for mammography screening. If an individual is a recipient of Medicaid or family care, there, it will establish a patient navigation program for those people who are diagnosed with breast cancer. It will establish a patient reminder system for mammograms. It will establish quality standards for mammography and give quality incentive payments to providers. It will give increased Medicaid reimbursements for mammography and reimburse community health centers for mammography if they perform it or if they partner with uh, their community hospital or academic medical center. And it also will give quality performance payments to primary care physicians who make sure that their patients receive annual mammograms. Let me just say that this bill has been signed. This is a done deal. So as we're thinking about these things, and this looks like a great you know, list of, wow, I wish that could happen. It now can happen. I'd like to now introduce Barbara Akpan, and she's gonna give her story, which is a profound and powerful one. I'd like to thank you, Marie, for that introduction. I'd also like to thank Dr. Olapati and the uh, Center for Continuing Medical Education uh, for allowing me to be a part. And don't let me forget, because I won't be able to live it down, 
I have to thank the Chicago Chapter National Black Nurses and the Metropolitan Chicago excuse me, Breast Cancer Task Force for allowing me to be a part of this conference. I kind of joined on a fluke. They needed a henchman, so they asked me, <laughs> they asked me to join. It's a private joke between us because I, I have no problem um, standing on what I believe in. So if I offend you today, don't take it personal. Charge it to my heart or to your head or whatever the saying goes because <laughs> I've lived and I've walked in those shoes and I'm here on behalf of all the women in Illinois whether they've had a breast cancer diagnosis or not. So don't hold it against me if I say something or step on your toes. I don't mean it, but I do mean it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was asked to give my um, personal testimony about, uh, or my perspective on what I thought the disparities were. And uh, in order for me to do that, I need to give you a little background so that you know I know what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about just Dr. Phillips' research that I've read and, and others about breast cancer. These are experiences that I've personally had in, with women and on behalf of women. I was diagnosed in the year of 2000 with stage two for those uh, medical people in the house, stage two infiltrating ductal um, carcinoma, undifferentiated type. And if I'm correct, that's the worst, uh, the undifferentiated, because the cells don't look like any of the normal cells. It's the most abnormal looking cell. And I was also diagnosed with triple negative disease, meaning that I didn't have any estrogen receptors, progestin receptors, or Herceptin receptors. So that means, for those that are not in the medical field, there is very little treatment for me outside of chemotherapy. So I, I, I'll say to you first, I'm a miracle. Because I'm standing here on the, the grace, the grace, the grace of God, and good health care. And I think part of the reason I got that good health care is because I got a big mouth <laughs> and I know how to talk. And I'm saying that for a reason because many of our women do not know how to speak up, don't have the education or the knowledge, they are full of fear, and they rather tuck their head than speak up for what they have a right to have. So I think. Part of that was because I knew how to navigate for myself. I am a nurse. That was to my advantage, but you don't have to be. But that helped me out because I had a better understanding of what was needed for my health. And I had a good team. I was treated at the University of Chicago where I worked. I got excellent care. I participated in a clinical trial, which few of us do participate in, for Taxol and Taxotere. At that time, they were comparing those two drugs. And I really believe that my participation in that clinical trial is one of the reasons I'm standing here today. So it's important that we participate in those trials. And I'm kind of getting off track, but I'm trying to send a message to somebody that it's important for us to participate in those trials because we're taking those drugs and we don't know how those drugs work in our bodies. So that's, it's kind of, I kind of got sidetracked. But let me back up a little bit and just go ahead and tell you that um, I became an advocate mainly be out of a need to regain power over my own body. I felt like my body failed me. I had cancer and couldn't explain it, but I had all the, the uh, all the, what's the right word I'm looking for? Somebody help me out. I had all the um, risk factors for, for getting it. I was black, I was overweight, I was obese. I was obese. 
I, I won't say that I didn't um, get my mammograms like I should. I missed one year. But in that one year um, that I did miss because I was working and forgot about it, that was the year I was diagnosed with breast cancer. My doctor's in this room somewhere, Dr. Conson. Where is she? Is she here? Okay, that's my physician. And she's been, she's been an awesome physician. I've had an awesome breast oncologist, a surgeon, radiologist, the whole team. Every woman deserves that. There was a, a, a round table and they discussed my case. They looked at my pathology. They did all the things and every discipline was represented and presented my case and I got the best care. But when I went for my chemo and my treatment, my radiation, I met women um, and I listened to their stories and it disturbed me so much I couldn't sleep. And I made God a promise that if he bring me through this, I was gonna do something about it. So what I did was I, I first started volunteering with um, different organizations, the American Cancer Society's Reach to Recovery Program, Gilda's Club, Sisters Network I joined. I did health fairs and I did church events and I went and got trained at the national level so I know how to advocate for women. And I did advocate for women in Congress with our legislators at the national, state, local level. And as things evolved, they've been talking about cancer for a long time. But um, as I talked to women, and we like to forget this, but I can't forget it. As I talked to women, I, I started to hear things that didn't make me feel good. The complaints they had about being afraid of dying. They were afraid of losing their breast, Not being able to care for their families because of this diagnosis. Not having insurance waiting long periods of time for a biopsy and a diagnostic mammogram or an ultrasound. They're having limited education and information on what their treatment was gonna be. Nobody was talking to these women about the treatment plan, but yet when I go to places like Gilda's Club, I had to come ready to, and prepared. I had to have my stuff in order because those women were ready for me. They knew the latest research. They knew that what their treatment was about. They knew what the plan of care was. They knew what their prognosis was most likely to be. They know what the outcomes, they knew what to expect. I wanted the same thing for my sisters. So I got angry, and I'm gonna be very honest with you. I got angry because I didn't see that happening and, I, and at that point, I knew that there was a double standard of care. I didn't like it. So I tried to do as much as I could to educate all women, but in particular black women, who come with all these myths and misunderstandings and, uh, and other issues like transportation, child care, and all these things that Janice talked about in her research. These are things that I heard with my own ears, and I didn't like it. So I tried to join organizations where I might could make an impact. I joined Dr. Warnke at, at the University of Illinois Center for Population Health and Health Disparities with their research with breast cancer. I also joined Dr. Eva Smith's research uh, with uh, black women and um, she was doing research on uh, mammography screening adherence. And so I've talked to a lot of women over the years since I've been diagnosed. And I want to believe that a lot has changed and a lot has changed. In 2006, after talking to one woman in particular early in the year, she told me she had been waiting for a long time just to get a biopsy. And I couldn't understand why was it taking so long for her to get this biopsy. So I called Stroger and I talked to somebody, I think it was one of the nurses, and I, you know, I gave her the blues. I said, why is it taking so long for this woman to get this biopsy? The longer she sits 
and that cancer sits in her breast, the more likely she is to convert and it becomes cancer. Why is it taking so long? Couldn't nobody tell me. And I just kept digging and pushing and digging and pushing until I found myself in the middle of something I didn't have any idea I would be in. I asked the question, how many women are waiting for diagnostics or some procedure? And to my dismay, I found out that maybe 11,000. And when you know when you ask the Lord to, to use you to do something, you don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> I said, God, I was so, I was numb and I was angry because not at the, the person that was over the program, but at the system. That was clearly a health system's problem that that many women had sat with a lump in their breast some for months and over a year and hadn't been able to get the services that they need. That to me is the, the worst disparity. And it's, I'm, I'm sorry, but I say shame on Chicago at that time. But the beauty of this whole thing is all these organizations, advocates, stroger, uh, legislators, everybody started coming together, working on the problem. And I'm very happy to say it's not a problem at Stroger's anymore. Thanks be to God. First, and to the people at Stroger's, the legislators and everybody that came together. But out of that came uh, the 37 recommendations. And since that time, I've lived to see the Breast Cancer Disparities Act come into play, and it answered every prayer for every woman that I had talked to. I wasn't there, but Angela was there in the trenches. Janice was in the trenches. And they were fighting for women when I couldn't fight for them. But they took care of every need that I know of that a woman had during the time that I've been out here. There is a double standard of care. And yes, we've come a long way. But one thing I can't seem to ex understand or explain is, why is it that women with insurance, African-American women, some with insurance, as well as those that are underinsured and with no insurance, are still dying from breast cancer, still with a lack of knowledge about breast screening, where to go get screened, how to navigate the system. Why is that? We can have all the conferences we want. We need to do a little bit more than have a conference. We know that not everybody gets the same care. And again, black women are receiving less treatment and fewer mammograms. But she wants me to wind it up. <laughs> you see I get carried away. Because I, 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 I'm feeling this in my heart. But let me end, let me end by saying that the system is still fragmented. We've come a long way. Women still don't know how to use the system. Some, some, some hospitals are doing certain procedures and not doing others. Even doctors don't always know where to send women to go. We need that universal system that's listed in the act. But my challenge for you today is to not just have conferences and keep talking about these disparities. Let's roll up our sleeves and work together in unity to change the things that we can change right now to prevent women from dying from breast cancer. Providers, Refer your uninsured patients that are diagnosed with breast cancer or have a suspicious finding to Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. And instead of us competing for health care, let's collaborate together to improve health care for all women, regardless of their race, their place, their insurance, or their socioeconomics. Every woman, and I mean every woman, Arab, black, 
white, Polish, every woman deserves quality breast cancer screening, screening and treatment. And thank you for your patience. I think today you've heard some of the most alarming statistics in the nation. You've also heard uh, about our current breast cancer crisis here in the city of Chicago. You've heard for, from two of the leading breast cancer advocates on the forefront in the fight against breast cancer. You've also heard about the Breast Cancer Task Force and all of its efforts to um, address that 116% mortality rate. And Barb Akpan has shared her personal perspective. She's been on the forefront for a very, very long time, very passionate. And no doubt the work of the University of Chicago, the task force, Susan G. Komen uh, for the cure, uh, many breast cancer survivors, advocates, and many of you in the room today have brought us to where we are at this moment in time. We still have a ways to go. And I ask as, as we move about this conference today that we not only reflect on what we have heard today, but more importantly, what will we do to reduce these ongoing disparities here in our Chicagoland area? Dr. Harold Freeman, who was a noted breast cancer surgeon, an advocate, once said that statistics are just numbers with the tears washed away. And so I ask you, what about the tears of the many women who are scrambling to find comprehensive breast cancer screening care here in our city? What about the tears of those women and families who are dying at an alarming rate here in our city of Chicago. What, we, what will we do to not only dry those tears, but what must we do to eliminate those tears? Today's conference theme is focused on uniting to end breast cancer disparities. And my personal perspective says that uh, more collaboration is welcome and sorely needed if we are to achieve this, this goal. I think when we look out around our Chicagoland area, I think it's important that we all work together and that we all read together, R-E-A-D. There's research that requires ongoing collaboration and as you heard earlier, more of a community participatory approach. There's education that's needed, not only on the part of our consumers, but also on the part of our providers. And I know many of you are here today, so I thank you for that. And then there's ongoing advocacy advocacy that really does result in, in better outcomes, and advocacy that moves beyond just facts and figures. And yes, we have the Breast Cancer Disparities Bill that was recently signed, but that's only the beginning. And yes, how will we honor those opportunities outlined in that Breast Cancer Disparities Act? And then there is a need for ongoing discovery and dissemination. Dissemination of what we know can work. And as we move about looking at discovery and dissemination, it's important that we also embrace those culturally sensitive approaches to limiting breast cancer disparities. This too requires collaboration. We must be open to engaging women, communities, and families, and survivors at the table with us so we can learn together, but more importantly, find those solutions. And so as we move forward today, I hope that we will all seriously reflect on today's conference, not only its theme, but its purpose. And it's my hope that at the end of the day, we will emerge better prepared to move forth in partnership with renewed energy, renewed commitment, and more importantly, a renewed sense of urgency. So before I take my seat, I just want to share with you my favorite proverb. It's an African proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. And so I hope we all move forward together to tie up this lion that we know to be breast cancer disparities. So thank you very much. There are some forms in the lobby for those who want to sign up to join the Breast Cancer Task Force as well as the Breast Cancer Quality Consortium.